The day was Sunday, October 1st, 2017. That's when we began our first study of the book of Acts. And today, almost three and a half years later, we're going to conclude our study of the book of Acts. I want to begin this morning by reminding you of my opening words from that very first sermon in Acts. I said, someone once said that our church services start at 11 o'clock sharp and end at 12 o'clock dull. Now, that may be true of some churches, but it doesn't have to be that way, and it's not supposed to be that way, because the story and the early history of the church, how it was born, how it initially spread the message of the gospel throughout the whole Roman Empire, and how it impacted so many lives is recorded for us in one of the most exciting books in the Bible, the book of Acts. And today, it is my pleasure, I said, to introduce to you this book which will be our study on Sunday mornings for quite a while. Well, quite a while has come, and it's about to go. Because now, three and a half years later, looking back, we can see that we have learned a number of, in fact, many valuable lessons from our study of Acts. So what are some of those valuable lessons? Well, we've certainly learned a great deal about the first leaders of the early church, men like Peter and Stephen, Philip, and of course, Paul, and how God used them in the spread of the gospel in the very first century. In addition, we have learned quite a bit about the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is mentioned about 50 times in the book of Acts. We've learned about His power in convicting unbelievers and empowering believers. We have seen His prominence in establishing local churches, in choosing church leaders and guiding believers, and even in resolving church doctrinal issues. From Acts, we have also learned much about the biblical approach to missions, to evangelism, to discipleship. From our study of Acts, we have gained insight into some of the most pressing questions that Christians have related to the charismatic movement. We have addressed the issue of speaking in tongues, of healings, of miracles. And from Acts, we have also learned what the Bible has to say about such issue as racial prejudice, about how the early Christians lived, and really the pattern, the New Testament pattern of local church government. Now, all these truths, and frankly, many, many more, are found in the book of Acts. However, as important as these truths are, and they are important, I want you to know the primary reason that the book of Acts is so valuable is because it answers one vitally important and critical question. The question is this, whatever happened to the, to that handful of disciples that we read about in the gospel narratives? Whatever happened to those men and women, those who follow Jesus as the Messiah? Whatever happened to them after he rose from the dead and then returned to the Father in glory? You see, the last time we see the disciples in any of the four gospel narratives, we find Jesus commissioning them to take the message of forgiveness of sins to all the nations of the world, not just Israel, go beyond the boundaries of Israel, all the nations of the world. And then the Lord leaves them as he ascends back to the Father in glory. Now, if this were all we were told from the New Testament, it would leave us, frankly, with more questions than we have answers because it would cause us to wonder how the gospel message and the church spread all over the Roman Empire. In other words, how in the world did Christ's message get from that obscure corner of the world known as Jerusalem, Israel, to the capital city of the greatest empire of that day, Rome, and all in one generation. How did, how did that possibly happen? That's a major question. Because from a human standpoint, the early church had really nothing going for her. She had no money. She had no experienced leaders. She had a message that was new, which no one outside of Israel had even heard. And I might add that when that message was heard, it was hated and often brought persecution. And yet this message spread rapidly across the Roman Empire so that at the end of the book of Acts, we could read in verses, in verse 14 of chapter 28, and thus we came to Rome. 
So how did this happen? How did this small group of followers of the Jewish Messiah with all kinds of obstacles and all kinds of hindrances, how did they take the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome? I mean, it's not right next door. How did this happen? Well, that's really what the book of Acts tells us. It answers that question. And that is the primary truth that we have been learning these last few years because Acts is essentially the story of the spread of Christianity in the first century. And it was specifically written to answer that question. How did the message of Jesus Christ move from its humble Jewish origins with only a handful of followers to become a major religious movement all over the Gentile world? Folks, that really sums up the book of Acts. It is the story of of what Jesus continued to do through his people after he returned to the Father following his earthly ministry. So I remind you that this is the reason why the book is called Acts, which is not really an inspired title, but it seems to have taken on this name in the second century. And it was called Acts because it reveals the ongoing acts or actions or activities of Jesus through his church. He's in glory, the church is on earth, he moves through them. Now, as I told you when we first started this study, that sometimes you hear this book referred to as the Acts of the Apostles. That's really not an accurate name, because while the 12 apostles are mentioned in the first chapter, most of the book, most of the book emphasizes the ministry of only two apostles, Peter and Paul. And that has been an important key, hermeneutical key, a key to help us study that's really helped us to understand what Acts is really about. See, contrary to what many people assume, Acts is not a broad, general, sweeping history of the early church and the spread of the gospel. I say that because there is a lot of information about how the gospel spread through various other apostles that Luke never mentions. Instead, he's very selective. As the Holy Spirit guided him, he's very selective in the material that he's chosen to write about, emphasizing, as I've already mentioned, the ministry of only two apostles, Peter and Paul. And there's a definite reason for this. As you'll recall, Luke's focus in the early chapters of Acts is on Peter and his ministry, taking us up to the point where he introduces the gospel to the Gentile world through a Roman soldier by the name of Cornelius. And then... Luke purposely moves on to tell us about Saul of Tarsus, who became the great apostle Paul, and the inroads that he made in spreading the gospel to the Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire. So Luke chooses to focus on Peter, who introduces Gentiles to the gospel, and then Paul, who becomes the apostle to the Gentiles and is the man most responsible for spreading the gospel message to Gentiles than anyone else in the early church. And what this specific focus on Acts tells us is that the purpose of Acts, the very reason it was written, was to explain, as I've said, how the gospel moved from Jerusalem, the center of Judaism, to the Gentile world, to the capital of the Gentile world, Rome. In other words, Luke's purpose in writing Acts is to explain that the gospel which was first preached in Israel wasn't limited to a handful of Jewish people, but it was to move and it was to conquer Gentile hearts all over the empire. That is to say, the message of this book is that no one and nothing can thwart the work of Jesus Christ because from heaven, he continues to work and do and teach through his church. See, Acts is a declaration of the sovereign power of Almighty God the sovereign power of Almighty God to overcome all obstacles and all hindrances so that no matter how difficult the early church had it, the victorious march of Christ's gospel cannot and will not be stopped. The gospel advanced through the world because God sovereignly willed it to advance so that it spread all over the Gentile world, even to a place far away from Israel, the imperial city, Rome itself. That brings us today to our concluding study of Acts, because as you'll recall, last Sunday we saw Paul finally, finally arrive in Rome, having survived being physically assaulted and then arrested in the city of Jerusalem, two years of imprisonment in Caesarea with 
uh, several very unjust trials, uh, a severe storm that threatened to end his life on the Mediterranean Sea, being shipwrecked on the islands of Malta, and then the final leg of his journey to Rome. With all of that, we ended our study last week by looking at verse 16, which says, when we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. Now, as I've told you a number of times in recent weeks, for some time Paul had had it in his heart, this deep yearning, this longing to visit Rome, not as a tourist, but as a witness for Christ. The apostle's heart was always to evangelize the unsaved, and that's why he was so eager to visit Rome, the most important city of its day. Three years earlier, in his letter to the Romans, Paul had expressed this great eagerness that was in his heart to come to Rome he's, he's, and to preach the gospel. That's why he was coming there. Romans chapter 1, verse 15. He said, so for my part, note this, I am eager. I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And now that he's arrived, now that he's finally in Rome, he's going to do exactly what he said he would do. He is going to evangelize those in Rome. And therefore, as we come to this last section in Acts, Luke focuses on Paul's evangelistic ministry to the people of Rome. And it's really only fitting that Acts should end this way because as we've already seen, the major emphasis in Acts has been on the spread of the gospel. Therefore, Luke's final message to us is that while the book of Acts may come to a close, and it certainly has to come to a close, the spread of the gospel doesn't come to a close. It just continues to advance. We can see this, that that's exactly the message that Luke has for us. He wants to leave with us. He does leave with us. You can see it by the way he closes Acts. Notice the last two verses in chapter 28. 30 and 31 say this, and he, meaning Paul, stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness and unhindered. Concerning this unusual, and it really is an unusual ending of a book, Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, he wrote this. He said, this remarkable book of Acts has also a remarkable ending. Have you ever come across a book that ended as this book does? It's been concerned with the Apostle Paul, his ministry, persecution, successes, and imprisonment. But then, at the very end, and we're expecting to learn how it all turned out, the story of Paul's life is abandoned. And all we read is that for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him boldly and without hindrance. He preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Boyce continues, it's not an ending that Luke merely threw in without thought. It is exactly the way Luke wanted his history to end because no matter how fascinating we may find the histories of Peter, Philip, Paul, or any of those strong personalities who dominate the book, the subject of Luke's narrative is not the lives of these servants of God, but the gospel. Luke is concerned with how the gospel grew and expanded. So when we get to the very end of Acts, we find that is happening. Christianity had begun in Jerusalem with the commissioning of the disciples by Jesus Christ, and now in the very heart of the capital of the Roman Empire, Paul is preaching, end of quote. And folks, the gospel has continued to spread and to advance, which, which is really why 2,000 years later, you and I have had opportunity to hear it, undiluted, unmessed up. We've had the opportunity to hear of the saving message of Christ and that message continues to spread all over the world because God is sovereignly causing it to spread, overcoming every obstacle, every hindrance. So this morning, as we conclude Acts, it is only appropriate that the book closes by revealing to us how God overcame three obstacles that Paul faced in his evangelistic efforts to the people of Rome. First obstacle being this, the Jewish people's antagonism towards Paul, their antagonism, their hostility towards Paul. And so we break in at verse 17. After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they came together, he began saying to them, brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our, people, of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, 
They were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. Having just told us in verse 16 that Paul entered the city of Rome, and instead of being placed in a prison, he was allowed to stay in his own lodgings. Luke now tells us that three days after arriving in the city and settling into his new lodgings, the apostle asked for the leading men from the Jewish community to meet with him at his residence. He couldn't go to them. He's asked for them to come to him. Now, who were these Jewish leaders? Well, we know from historical records that in the first century, there were about 40,000 Jewish people who lived in the city of Rome. Now, just a few years prior to this, according to Acts chapter 18, verse 2, all Jewish people had been banned from Rome by the emperor Claudius. But obviously now, that's been reversed, and they're back in the city. We also know that with this large of a Jewish population, that there were at least 10 synagogues in the city of Rome at that time. So most likely the Jewish leaders who Paul met with were rabbis and influential men from these various synagogues around the city. Now, before we look at what Paul had to say to these men, I want you to notice something significant. Luke says that after only three days in Rome, Paul summoned these men. Now let's think about this. After all that Paul has recently been through, and he was not a young man at this, at this point, namely what? Namely the grueling journey from Caesarea, the storm at sea, and the subsequent shipwreck, the three months on Malta, walking many miles on foot across the mainland of Italy to reach Rome. With all of this having just recently gone on in his life, he only took three days to recover. And then he's ready to move forward in evangelizing. What a man. What an example to us of evangelistic zeal and passion. This is his heart. After settling into his new lodging and giving himself only three days to regroup, Paul wastes no time in reaching out to the Jewish community for the purpose of evangelizing them. This is not a goodwill tour. This is evangelism. This was his priority. And just as he told the church at Rome in his letter, he's eager to preach the gospel to the people of this city. He wastes no time. He's ready. It's exactly what he was doing by inviting these Jewish leaders to meet with him in his home. Remember, as we've seen many times in Acts, whenever Paul would come into a city, there's always the same pattern. He would go to the Jewish synagogue, proclaim Christ to them, and then he would reach out to the Gentile community. And that's what he's doing here in Rome. But as I said, since he, he, couldn't have, uh, he couldn't travel to them, to their synagogues, to visit them, he didn't have the freedom, so he invites these men to come to him. But before he could directly evangelize them, note this, he first needed to introduce himself to them and to explain to them why he was innocent of any wrongdoing against the Jewish people. Otherwise, and this is a big otherwise. Otherwise, he'd have no credibility with them. They wouldn't listen to him. So Paul tells them about the events that led to his recent arrival in their city. He tells them about his arrest in Jerusalem by, by the Romans. He tells them about how after being examined by the Romans, they were willing to release him because he said, I, I had done nothing worthy of death. However, they didn't release him, but not because he was guilty of wrongdoing, but only because the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem, namely the Sanhedrin, they objected. And that's why he was forced to appeal to stand trial before Caesar, and thus the reason he's now in Rome. Now, what I want you to notice is that in explaining his situation to these Jewish leaders, Paul's emphasis is that in spite of the accusation against him by the Jews of Jerusalem, he had done nothing against the Jewish people or their religious customs. He is really defending himself at this point. This is what he told them. Notice verse, the, uh, verse 17, right in the middle. Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Notice, he's defending himself. I've done nothing wrong, he's saying. Along these same lines, 
He wants them to know that in appealing to Caesar, he has no intention of making any negative accusation against the Jewish people of Jerusalem. He's not going to, as we would say, counter-sue somebody. Notice verse 19. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any accusation against my nation. He's just assuring them. I'm not opposed to the nation. See, what Paul wants these Jewish leaders to know is that in spite of the hostility towards him by those in Jerusalem, in spite of all that, he's a loyal Jew. He's not someone who's antagonistic towards the Jewish community or their religious beliefs. In fact, he wants them to know that the real reason for his arrest is because of Israel's hope. What is Israel's hope? Israel's hope is in the coming of the Messiah. Notice what he tells them in verse 20. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. In other words, the reason I have this chain around my wrist, gentlemen, the reason I'm being guarded by this Roman soldier, the reason I'm a prisoner in your city is because of the great hope that that we share, the hope in the coming of the Jewish Messiah. So what Paul is doing, he is affirming his commitment to the Jewish people and their mutual belief in God's promise to send them Messiah. Now, he hasn't told them about his faith in Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah. He will, but not at this point. He's just explaining to them that his arrest has to do with the common hope as Jews that they all share, and that is the hope of Messiah's coming. Now, the reason Paul put it like this was really to whet their interest so that they'll want to hear more about his view of the Messiah. He hasn't told them who he believes the Messiah is. So this is sort of a little teaser to create a a sense of curiosity about Paul's faith in order to open the door for him to proclaim the gospel to them. But he knows that this will never happen. He knows that they will never give him an audience, that they will never sit down and listen to him when he tells them about Jesus. If they think that he is hostile towards Judaism, towards their religion, towards their customs. And why would they think that he was hostile towards their religious customs? Well, because Paul is concerned that the leaders from Jerusalem have spread lies about him. That that these lies have turned the Jewish community in Rome against him. That's what he's afraid of. This is why he's invited these men to meet with him so that he can defend himself and explain his loyalty to the Jewish people and his belief in the Jewish Messiah. See, if he can't convince these men that he is not a criminal against Judaism, that the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem claim he is, then they'll never give him an audience. They'll never give him the opportunity to present Christ to them. And that's the obstacle that Paul is facing here in his attempt to evangelize these men. It's the obstacle of potential antagonism against him that will prevent a fair hearing of the gospel. But watch what happens, because as Luke continues, he tells us how God overcame this potential obstacle to the gospel being proclaimed to these Jewish leaders in Rome. Verse 21, they said to him, we have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. Now, isn't this interesting? In spite of Paul's concern that the leaders from Jerusalem have sent a bad report about him to these Roman Jews, these men claim to know nothing against him, nothing against Paul. They tell Paul that they hadn't received any word about him from Jerusalem, either by letters or by a personal report. Now, folks, this may seem like a small thing, but it's really not. It's a huge thing because this is God's way of communicating to us that he has overcome an obstacle to the gospel spreading in Rome. See, as I've already said to you, if these Jewish leaders in Rome had heard a negative report about Paul from Jerusalem, and they would never have agreed to meet with him and listen to what he had to say about Jesus because they would have already been prejudiced against him. They would have not given him a hearing. The only explanation for this not happening is that the Lord sovereignly orchestrated this lack of information from Jerusalem about him so as to to prevent the men of the Sanhedrin from giving 
and untrue and a distorted picture of Paul and the message that he preached. For the sake of advancing the gospel, God would not allow the Roman Jews to develop a bias against Paul before they ever had an opportunity to hear him explain the gospel to them. Now, in light of the fact of this extreme, and remember the extreme hostility of the leaders in Jerusalem against Paul, their relentless pursuit of trying to put him to death. I mean, these men didn't give up. It really is surprising that they didn't send word to Rome about him. I mean, they despised him. They said that this man should not live any longer. He's not worthy to be on the earth any longer. This is so surprising that one commentary, one commentator I read this week said this, their claim to know nothing about Paul was undoubtedly untrue. So what he's saying is these men are lying. But is that really the case? Is that really the case? Well, the text, give, text gives no indication that these Jewish men of Rome were lying. And there's really no reason to think that they would lie about this because they had absolutely nothing to gain by lying about this. So I take it at face value that they were saying the truth. That they were not lying. They had received nothing from Jerusalem that would have tainted their view of Paul. I see no reason to take anything other than that, than that view. And it's really not difficult to believe what they're saying because of the sheer logistics of sending any negative word about Paul to Rome. So think about this. The Apostle Paul departed from Israel on one of the last ships sailing during the winter season. I mean, that's the whole point of why there was a storm. And Paul said, I advise you, don't go out in this weather. So one of the last ships sailing during the winter season. And he arrived in Italy on one of the first ships after the winter season. So logistically, there just wouldn't have been time for any letters to arrive in Rome before Paul arrived there, nor would there have been time for anybody else to, to get there in time if they traveled by boat. But the fact that these Roman men didn't know anything negative about Paul, it doesn't mean that they hadn't heard anything negative about the message of the gospel that Paul preached. Notice what they tell Paul in verse 22. But we desire to hear from you what your views are for concerning this sect it's known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. So even though they had heard nothing against Paul, they had certainly heard negative things against Christianity because throughout the Roman Empire, many Jewish people were speaking against it. Nevertheless, they say, we're willing, Paul, to listen to you so you can explain your views to us. And that means that Paul will have the opportunity to proclaim Christ to these men, which is precisely the reason for meeting with them. So, folks, what is the principle? What is the timeless truth that these verses are teaching us? Well, the principle is that when it comes to the gospel, there's nothing that God won't do to advance it. It is his priority. God has determined that this message of salvation in Jesus Christ will not be hindered from spreading, and therefore no one and nothing can put an obstacle up that he will not tear down and overcome. Even the angry hostility of the men of Jerusalem, men who were so determined to end Paul's life that they tried to assassinate him, even that could not prevent the gospel from spreading. And the same thing holds true today. All the antagonism towards Christianity, as seen in the horrible persecution of Christians in Islamic countries, communist countries, cannot contain the advancement of the gospel. You would think that leaders of these countries would do some research and study the history of trying to stamp out Christianity. It doesn't happen. It never has happened. It will never happen. In fact, just the opposite takes place. Regardless of what governments do to try to silence the gospel in Christians, it always backfires. The gospel keeps moving forward and changing lives. It advances. So be encouraged to share your faith in Christ. Never be intimidated by any attempts to hinder you. Why? Because the Lord in heaven is moving through you, moving through you to communicate that message of salvation, overcoming every obstacle that threatens to silence the words of truth.
And so with these Roman leaders agreeing to hear what Paul has to say, Luke now proceeds to tell us about a second obstacle that God overcame in Paul's efforts to evangelize the people of Rome. The first obstacle was the Jewish people's antagonism towards Paul. He overcame that. They're ready to listen to him. The second obstacle the Lord overcame is the Jewish people's rejection of the gospel. Verses 23 and 24. When they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. Now Luke tells us that on a pre-arranged day, these same Jewish men, with possibly even more joining them because the text says that they came in large numbers. They visited Paul at his lodgings. At this time, though, it's for the purpose of hearing the apostles' religious views, which they know that he teaches everywhere. And so all day long, we read, from morning until evening, Paul testified to them about the kingdom of God as he tried to persuade them from the Old Testament that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. In other words, Paul explained to them about God's kingdom in the sense of his kingdom being the realm of salvation over which he reigns as king and that, <coughs> excuse me, the way to enter his kingdom is by faith in Jesus as Messiah. That's been Paul's message all day. He did this by showing them from their own Bibles, uh, the Old Testament, both the law of Moses and the prophets, all the messianic prophecies that have been fulfilled by Jesus. And no doubt Paul spent this day-long Bible study dialoguing with these learned men. I don't think there was a monologue. As their rabbis would have certainly asked him questions, and they would have also challenged his Christian interpretation of the Scriptures. And explaining what this day must have been like, one Bible teacher said this. He said, the large numbers came to the apostles, large numbers rather, came to the apostles' lodging, the most exciting home Bible study in history. We can be sure Paul aimed high in, in this unique opportunity to share the gospel. The word translated explained means to set out or place before. Paul gave his argument with detailed logic and care. This culminated in trying to convince them about Jesus. All his persuasive powers were brought to bear upon his hearers from morning till evening. This was not an hour of study and then cookies and punch. It was 10 to 12 hours of serious discussion daily. But even with all of Paul's verbal ability to present a persuasive case, a persuasive argument for Jesus being the Messiah, the result was that only some of the men in the room believed. They believed what the apostle was saying while others refused to believe it, as we read in verse 24. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. Now listen, this mixed reaction should not surprise us, because throughout the book of Acts, this is what we've seen. Seen exactly the same response whenever Paul would present the gospel to Jewish people. He'd go into a synagogue, some would believe, and some would not believe. And much of the time, those who didn't believe turned violent and persecuted Paul. Well, that wasn't the case here, but nonetheless, it was the same reaction, a reaction of rejecting the gospel. These Roman Jews, they were not violent, as I said, but the same thing was happening to them in terms of their reaction to the gospel. Some, after listening to Paul, were persuaded, and they did believe that Jesus was Messiah. And then some refused to believe. And so at the end of the day, and I'm using that literally, literally the end of this day, there was a great divide between those who believed and those who did not. And they began to leave Paul's residence, but not, but not before the apostles spoke boldly to them about their unbelief, as we read in verses 25 through 27. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your father, saying, go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing but will not understand. You will keep on seeing but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. And with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. And once again, 
I say this, that Paul, who certainly had a lot of experience with those who rejected the gospel, once Paul realized that many who had heard him that day chose, made a decision, chose to reject the truth that Jesus was the Messiah, he confronted them about their unbelief. And when they heard what he had to say, it broke up the meeting and everybody left Paul's house. And no wonder, no wonder they left because what Paul said to them was a stunning rebuke of their unbelief. As the apostle is quoting here from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, and he is applying it to them. He said, rightly did Isaiah say to your fathers, and I'm applying it to you. It speaks of not simply about Israel's unbelief, but about their willful unbelief, their stubborn unbelief. Hardened unbelief, which has left them so hardened in their hearts, he says, that even when they heard and saw the truth, it didn't penetrate their calloused hearts. It didn't pierce them with conviction of sin. In fact, they were so hardened in their hearts that they weren't even able to comprehend the truth, though the truth was staring them right in the face. Folks, this is the very reason that the vast majority of Jewish people rejected Jesus as Messiah in the first century, and why they still reject him today. Unbelief that has hardened their hearts has been the pattern for the Jewish people for nearly all of their history. Do not think that the Jewish people, for the most part of their history, were very nice in their belief, but just maybe a little naughty. No, that's not true. As one searches the Old Testament, you soon realize that the history of the Jewish people, the history of the nation of Israel, is one of ongoing unbelief and stubborn rejection of God's truth with very few examples otherwise. Listen to what the Lord said to Israel through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, verses 25 and 26. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising early and sending them. Yet... They did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, and they did more evil than their fathers. And this attitude of continual stubborn unbelief is the reason why when Jesus showed up, that the majority of Jewish people rejected him. Listen, this very passage of Scripture from Isaiah 6, Jesus used this two times, at least two times that we know of, because two times are recorded in the gospel accounts, Matthew 13 and John 12. He used it to tell the, the people to rebuke them about their unbelief. Now, in light of Israel's unbelief and rejection of Jesus, I want to point out something important to you. It's very important that you understand this. There are some people today, some who are reputable Bible teachers, who believe and they teach that God has rejected Israel and replaced Israel with the church. And he's done this, they say, because of Israel's rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. In other words, their thinking is this. They rejected him, so he rejected them. That's absolutely wrong. Absolutely unbiblical. Scripture does not teach that. In fact, in speaking about God's covenant with Israel, Paul said just the opposite. Listen to what the apostle wrote in Romans 11 verse 29, and this is concerning Israel. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. See, God never cancels his promises, and he's made many wonderful, unconditional promises to Israel, which he will keep. Why? Because he's faithful. That's why. But in addition, it's important to understand that the rejection of Jesus by the Jewish people, it wasn't something new. It didn't catch the Lord off guard. Where did this come from? No, it was merely, watch this, it was the culmination of years and years of hardened unbelief so that when the Messiah finally came and stood in front of, in front of them, they did what they had done throughout their history. They refused to submit their hearts to his authority. And so they rejected Jesus. This shouldn't be surprising to anybody if you understand the Old Testament. Having ears, they could not hear the truth about Christ. Having eyes, they could not see the truth about Christ. 
though Jesus taught and ministered in their very presence. Therefore, no matter how capable Paul was in presenting his arguments for Jesus being the Messiah, many of these Roman Jewish leaders, they refused to believe. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, Steve, I thought you said that this passage in Acts 28, I thought you said it's about God overcoming all obstacles in the spread of the gospel. So how did the Jewish people's rejection of Jesus reveal God's ability to overcome this obstacle? Well, I'm glad you asked that because the answer is found in verse 28. Therefore, Paul says, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They also will listen. The last thing Paul said to these Jewish people before they left his residence was that with Israel's refusal to believe the gospel, God has determined to send the gospel to the Gentiles. And many of them, certainly doesn't mean all of them, but many of them will listen and they'll be saved. My friends, for nearly 2,000 years, God has been at work saving Gentiles. Yes, some Jewish people, but mostly Gentiles. And the fact that almost all evangelical churches today are made up of a, ma a majority of Gentile Christians like yourself, testifies to that truth. His plan to spread the gospel has not been hindered by Israel's unbelief. You see, God's objective in advancing the gospel will never be thwarted, not even by the hardened unbelief of his covenant people, Israel, because his plan has always been, it's not new, it's always been to send the gospel to the Gentiles, meaning non-Jews of the world, and to bring many of them into his kingdom. Interestingly and ironically, Paul actually explained this in detail in his letter to the Romans three years earlier. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. This is a critical passage of Scripture. For those of you who think and listen to other teachers who are telling you that God has replaced Israel with the church, listen to what Paul said, because Paul didn't say that. I say then... God has not rejected his people, has he? Paul asked that very question. Has he permanently rejected his people? Now, some say, yes, he had. He has. Paul says, may it never be. I'd rather agree with Paul. Paul said, may it never be. Very strong words in the original Greek text. May it never be. The thought is like perish the thought. Don't even bring up something so preposterous as that. And then he explains. And he defends what he's just said. For I too... I'm an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've torn down your altars. And I alone am left. And they're seeking my life. But what is the divine response? You understand Elijah is saying, I'm the only one left. I'm the, of all the nation, I'm the only one left. And, Elijah, and God's going to tell Elijah, you're wrong. What's the divine response to him? I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And then Paul makes this concluding logical statement. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Now what Paul is saying here is that even though the Jewish nation, as a nation, as a whole, as an entity, has rejected Jesus, God has not rejected the Jewish people. And the proof of this is that there is always in every generation a remnant. What does a remnant mean? It means a small minority, a small number of Jewish people who believe the gospel. And Paul is using himself as an example of this. He said, if God has rejected Israel because they rejected Christ, what do you do about me? Because I was once the greatest Christ rejecter of them all. And yet here I am a Jewish person from a prominent tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, and I'm a believer in Jesus. What's more, go back in your history and see that Elijah, who thought that he was the only one, God said, no, there's 7,000 who make up the remnant who are following me. And then Paul makes a concluding statement in every generation, every generation, there's always been a small minority, not the majority, but a small minority of Jewish people who believe in Christ. And that's true today. In addition, Paul went on to write that though the vast majority 
of Jewish people reject the gospel. God has not permanently cast the Jewish people away, but rather he has, watch this, he has temporarily set them aside in this day and age, the church age, in order to focus on bringing many Gentiles to himself. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 11, 11. I say then they did not stumble as to fall, did they? He means they didn't stumble as to fall permanently, as if God cast them away. Once again, he says, may it never be. By their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. See, God didn't set Israel aside to permanently abandon them, but rather to ultimately save them. And the way this works is that the conversion of Gentiles during the church age is designed by God to stir Jewish people to jealousy, so that when you witness to them as a Gentile believer and you tell them about Christ, they ought to be jealous. Why? Because you have something they don't have. You have faith in the Jewish scriptures. You have faith in the Jewish Messiah. You have peace in your heart, forgiveness of sins that God promised to the Jewish people if they would accept him. You have a relationship with the God of Israel. They don't have that. And when Jewish people, at least some, when they hear you witnessing to them, they ought to be stirred to be jealous. They ought to say in their hearts, I want what that Gentile has. And someday, someday, the entire nation, alive at the time, will turn to Christ for salvation because there is coming a day, the Bible says, just before Jesus returns, when the entire nation of Israel, meaning not every Jew who has ever lived, but the people, the Jewish people, alive at that time, at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, they will repent of their sin. They will come to faith in Christ. That's the meaning of Romans 11, 26, and 27. So all Israel will be saved, meaning Israel at that time, those Jewish people alive, living on planet Earth at that time. Just as it is written, Paul said, the deliverer will come from Zion. He'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. What could be clearer? So far from hindering the advancement of the gospel, Jewish unbelief has actually resulted in the gospel being spread to Gentiles. And Gentiles today, as I've said, you have the opportunity to share the gospel with Jewish people. In fact, Gentile Christians are the best witnesses to Jewish people. When I go to share with a Jewish person, person, I'm a traitor to them. They don't really want to hear from me. They will listen to you. They don't consider you a traitor. They'll listen to you. So speak to them. Listen, nothing hinders the Lord. His plan to advance the message of salvation in Christ will always move ahead regardless of the unbelief of the Jewish people or any people group. Now, so far, Luke has revealed two obstacles that the Lord overcame. And now he moves on to the third and last one. The last one is this. What did the Lord do to overcome an obstacle in Paul's efforts to evangelize the people of Rome? He did it by giving Paul the opportunity to proclaim Christ from his home. Starting in verse 29, we read, When he had spoken these words, <coughs> the Jewish people, or the Jews, departed, having a great dispute amongst themselves. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness, unhindered. Now, since the best Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, they do, they do not include verse 29 Therefore, I will not comment on it. But what is important and is definitely a part of the inspired text of Scripture are the final two verses of Acts, which tell us that Paul remained in custody in the city of Rome for the next two years as he awaited his trial before Caesar. And during this entire two-year period, Luke says that he stayed in his own rented quarters, which seems to indicate that Paul's freedom to, to leave his apartment, to move uh, around the city of Rome, that that was taken from him since he would have been constantly chained to a Roman soldier who kept guard over him. But the fact that Paul wasn't free to leave his residence didn't mean that he was unable to proclaim the gospel because Luke tells us that during these two years, he was busy Doing what? Well, one of the things he's busy doing is receiving visitors. He welcomed all, we read, so that he was able to continue telling others the message of salvation in Christ. And notice the last few words of Acts. With all openness, unhindered. 
In other words, even in Paul's imprisonment, the gospel was not hindered from spreading because the Lord brought many people to Paul. He couldn't go to them, so the Lord sent them to him. And he proclaimed Christ to all of them, and nobody stopped him. Nobody. In fact, it was during this time, this two-year period, that the gospel advanced greatly. Why do I say that? Because while under house arrest in a home, Paul wrote several letters of which Philippians was one of them. He wrote Philippians from Rome. Here's what he said, Philippians chapter 1, 12, uh, verses 12 and 13. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Let me stop here and say the people of Philippi and others who knew Paul must have thought, oh, poor Paul, he's stuck in some type of imprisonment. The gospel's not getting out. He's not planting any churches. What a terrible situation for Paul. He said, I want you to know, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Explain it, Paul, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. That's the elite Roman Guard and to everyone else. You see, in addition to witnessing to all who came to see him, think about this. Every time there was a change in the soldiers guarding him, Paul had the opportunity to share the gospel with that man. I mean, where, where's the man going to go? It's like sitting next to someone on a full airplane and witnessing to them about Christ. Where are they going to go? So this soldier is chained to Paul, and Paul must have said something like, so tell me your name. Tell me a little bit about you. And then would have moved into the gospel. And these men, they went home, and as another soldier came, and they went home, and apparently they, they told their family about this unusual man who they'd been watching. They told their friends about this unusual prisoner who's told them about Jesus of Nazareth. And so far from hindering the, the spread of the gospel, Paul's imprisonment actually advanced the gospel. And how far did the gospel advance? Philippians 4.22 gives us a remarkable, remarkable statement. Paul said at the end of this letter, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Are you kidding me, Paul? Even servants in the household of Caesar have heard the gospel and some have accepted it. That's exactly what he's saying. See, although Paul was in chains, the gospel was not chained and it never will be chained because God has decreed that the gospel will keep on advancing until Jesus returns. It's also important to know that while under house arrest in Rome, Paul wrote, in addition to Philippians, he wrote Ephesians, he wrote Colossians, he wrote Philemon. So far from hindering the spread of the gospel, Paul's imprisonment was used by God to advance the gospel. And folks, that's how the book of Acts ends, with Paul proclaiming Christ while a prisoner in Rome. And just as Jesus promised Paul, the apostle did testify of his faith in Rome. And while the book of Acts comes to a close, I want you to understand the story of the gospel advancing, it never ends. Because God is determined to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. And he has chosen to use us, you, me, to be his instruments. And so I close our study in Acts with these very fitting words from Dr. Homer Kent in his commentary on Acts. Dr. Kent writes this. Thus, Luke brought to an end his absorbing account of the most dramatic 30 years of Christian history. From the beginnings in Jerusalem with a little band of disciples in an upper room, he has sketched with sure and steady strokes the advance of the church across the land of its birth to the very capital of the Roman world. Neither persecution from the state nor occasional unfaithfulness within its own ranks could stop its relentless march. The reason, of course, was that the risen Christ was working by his spirit within the believers, accomplishing the goals that he had laid before them. The challenge remains for the modern reader to place his faith likewise in Jesus Christ and become a part of this incomparable enterprise, which Acts so graphically describes. The same Jesus and the spirit are still accomplishing the purposes of God in the lives of men. It would 
be wrong of me to close this series by not saying, have you placed your trust in Christ? How tragic that you would sit and listen to a series for years about the gospel advancing and yet never let it advance into your heart. You can be very faithful in church and yet never have trusted Christ as your Savior. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Him. There is nothing more important in life than this. There is no more important message than the gospel. I appeal to you. Let today be the day of your salvation. If you want to speak to any of our pastors about this, just see me when we close the service, which we're about to do. Let me close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this great privilege of studying Acts verse by verse for almost three and a half years to study this, Lord. And I pray as uh, we leave this book, we move on to other texts of Scripture, I pray that these precious truths would echo in our hearts, would transform the way we live, and certainly motivate us to be faithful in sharing you with others. We thank you, Lord, that there is no other name given amongst men except Jesus Christ, whereby we must be saved. So I pray for any here, any in this auditorium, any who are watching, any who will someday listen to this, that you might draw them to yourself and bring them to faith. We also, Lord, pray that you will help us to always remember the priority of the gospel. It's not an ancient message simply for unsaved people. It's a message for us to preach to ourselves, to keep before us. Yes, to tell others who are lost about you, but also to remember what a precious message this is. And we thank you for it, Lord. And we thank you that you will always see to it that the gospel goes to the ends of this earth. I pray, Lord, for our own community that we'll reach out with the gospel. I pray that as we support missionaries and send them out, I pray that, that they will be able to proclaim the word of salvation unhindered in whatever community they minister in. All of this we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for coming.